Hi everybody, I hope all is well. It's a beautiful November day, a bit chilly, but the sun is out, so we are outside trying to get as much vitamin D as possible. And you know what I did on the weekend? I took all my feeders down and I washed them all really well, and that felt so good. dying to install an owl box in our property for years now last year i actually bought one but then we got too busy the winter came it was too late so this fall i set my mind to put it up and fall is actually uh, the best time to put up an owl box as you might know owls start breeding rather early sort of february march so this gives them enough time to discover your box but don't be discouraged if they don't do it right away it's not uncommon for them to take their time so how did i decide on which box to get let me walk you through this so i went to nestwatch.org then i selected the section right bird right house i live in quebec and then my property is open woodland and here cornell showed me a list of all the birds that might nest on my property. So I decided to go for a box that will accommodate Eastern Screech Owls or Northern Sowet Owls. As you can see, if you scroll down, uh, they tell you where to install the box, how far off the ground, which way to face it. So I'm following all these instructions. I filled it with pine shavings. And as for installing the box, I decided to go with the live tree because I have plenty on my property. Um, I actually talked to a colleague of my Claudette and she said that the healthiest thing we can do to a tree when attaching anything to it is not to screw or nail that something to it, but rather use straps and wrap it around the tree. So that's exactly what we're doing. Thanks Claudette. Brian Lumley has been a bird watcher all his life and he says that he's only seen great blue herons being by themselves. And that's true, I've only seen them by themselves. But a few weeks ago, he had a whole flock of them flying over his property. So he's curious what they were up to. I was intrigued by your observation of a flying flock of 10 or more great blue herons in the Port Stanley area of Ontario on the north shore of Lake Erie in the middle of August. What really makes it interesting is that you've seen this group of herons on several occasions and that you're not far from Hawk Cliff, which we all know to be a very popular place to watch migrating hawks. So it would be really easy to assume that this is just a flock of migrating blue herons. But there are a few things wrong about reaching such a conclusion. First, August is much too early for this species to migrate south. And second, I'm not aware that these herons migrate in flocks of that size. I have seldom seen them flying myself in numbers any greater than, say, a mated pair. On the other hand, my Montreal birding friends, who have been counting migrating raptors there for four or five decades, have observed as many as six of these herons migrating together. And going from six to ten is not that much of a stretch. However, since you appear to be seeing this group of birds on more than one occasion, I suggest that you're witnessing random movements between a local feeding ground and a nighttime roosting spot. Great blue herons are a very social species, usually choosing to nest and or sleep in rookeries of sometimes hundreds of birds, often in tree copses. Some birds do nest in the ground, but this is less common. They also gather in fairly large numbers at shallow seaside tidal areas, each keeping their distance from one another. And one can even see them foraging for mice in fallow fields far from water bodies. By now, likely all of you watching this edition of Brome Bird News will be aware of the recent oil spill off Southern California that has coated shorelines and marine life, including water birds, in black tar. The latest conclusion on its cause is that a cargo ship anchor snagged an oil pipeline and caused a rupture in it, unleashing a slick of about 3,400 barrels of oil over an area comprising just over 8,000 acres, somewhere between Huntington Beach and Dana Point. Comparing it to the Deepwater Horizon spill of 2 million barrels and the Exxon Valdez spill of 260,000 barrels, experts are referring to this oil spill as modest in size. But it's much more complicated than that. The Deepwater oil was light, sweet, crude, almost like cooking oil, 
and it was 50 miles offshore, giving plenty of time to prepare for cleaning operations. In contrast, this latest California spill is a very heavy, dense oil containing the more toxic asphaltines, and it reached the beaches before anyone even knew there was a spill. So for the birds, this particular oil spill poses two major problems. The oil contains polycyclic aromatic compounds, which can be very toxic and also carcinogenic. Because the oil birds find it difficult to regulate their body temperature, they fluff out their feathers and preen them with their beaks. Naturally, they ingest the oil. Some even breathe the oil into their lungs and circulatory system. So even though some birds get the oil cleaned off with special detergents by legions of caring environmentalists, their prognosis for survival is not good. Worse, this oil is likely to enter various estuaries and marshes in the area where it can't even be cleaned up. We don't yet know how many birds have been and will be affected by the spill, but we do know that its impact on the birds will be felt for decades. Durham University just published a study on birds changing their migratory patterns in Europe, stating that some of the birds stay longer, in some cases up to 60 days longer, before they decide to migrate to sub-Saharan Africa in the fall. All of this is being linked to climate change because well, the weather is so much warmer in the fall, there is so much more food available that birds don't really need to go anywhere. Unfortunately, scientists are afraid that if this trend continues, then birds will decide not to migrate at all. And that might be harmful to them because there is still a lack of food in the winter. And we also have to remember that birds play such a vital role in seed dispersal and insect control. So if they show up too late or don't show up at all uh, at the winter grounds, those countries might be affected negatively in the long term. Last episode, we talked about Australia's Bird of the Year award going to the superb fairy wren. Well, last week, New Zealand announced its winner and things were a little bit different there this year because the winner is not actually a bird, but a bat. The Pekka Pekka Toro or the long-tailed wattle bat. Phew. It's not just the birds that have such long names, was a clear winner with the Kakapo and the K in the second and the third place. Originally, the public was a little bit surprised and shocked that a bat was being added to the competition. But then New Zealand Land and Forest explained that this bat was so endangered and not a lot of people actually knew that this bat existed, that it needed as much attention as it could get. And guess what? The campaign really worked the bat is now world famous and hopefully this will help with its conservation. And a quick update on France's uh, strange bird trapping uh, practices. As you might know, the French government, despite everything, issued licenses to continue their old-fashioned uh, bird trapping practices. But the French Supreme Court stepped in and revoked all the licenses and stated it very clearly that anyone caught trapping birds with glue or nets will be punished to the full extent of the French law. You know, birds are such curious creatures. Every time we film in our backyard, one or two of them come over and check on us. There's a, a chickadee hopping from one branch to another and trying to tell us something. So fascinating. Anyway, the city of Guelph in Ontario decided to become a good example in helping reduce bird collisions. So they hired a local artist who came and decorated the windows of the city hall with this beautiful artwork. Check it out. It's absolutely gorgeous. They also released bird safe guidelines, which are to help the owners of the buildings in the city to make their structures bird safe. Well, goodbye for now. Please remember our photo contest is still open. It's birds and colors. And let me know if you've had any luck with your owl boxes. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.